Amen. <laughs> Nothing compares to the promises we have in you, Lord. How many of you are thankful to be here this Palm Sunday morning? If you're thankful to be here this morning and you received a palm, let me see you share that good news with your palm. We're going to use these palms in our worship today, worshiping the Lord, uh, thanking God for his faithfulness. So we, when we sing, I would invite you just to take your palm. Now, you may have a palm branch and an empty palm, so use them both to praise the Lord this morning. So we're going to use what the Lord has given us to worship the Lord. And so I want to invite you as we begin our time of worship to hear a psalm. A psalm of, of King David that invites us this morning to recognize who indeed the Lord is on this incredible day. The Lord reigns! Exclamation point. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim and the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all people. Let them praise your great and awesome name for you, O Lord, are holy. Anyone want to proclaim with me this morning that God indeed is holy? God is holy and worthy of our praise, and for that reason we've gathered in this sacred space to worship the Lord. And so we are going to be about the business of worshiping God today. And so before we move into the business of worshiping God, we are the body of Christ. We are the hands, the feet, the eyes, the ears. And as the body of Christ, there is work to be done in this day and in this week serving the Lord together. And so I want to invite you to note just a couple of announcements. As you were greeted this morning, you should have been handed a bulletin, welcomed and handed a bulletin. So I welcome you again, but I want to quickly be about the business of a couple of things so that we can be about the business of worshiping the Lord. You may know already this week is Holy Week. Uh, we begin Holy Week, the Passion of Christ, today on Palm Sunday. We move into the week acknowledging the gift of God and the person of Jesus Christ. On Wednesday, we will not meet this week as is typical for us as the body. We will meet on Thursday, which is Monday Thursday. Remembering that from uh, the Latin word mandatum comes the word mandate or mandi. It's the evening that Christ celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. He gave them the last commandment, which is love as I have loved you. And so we're going to gather on, when, on Thursday evening at 6. We're going to have a meal together. The men's ministry of our church will be cooking fish and all the sides. So first, sign up in the information center if you would like to participate in that wonderful meal and fellowship. And then at 7, we're going to move across the breezeway, some from the parking lot, some from the breezeway. We're going to gather here at 7 p.m. And we're going to celebrate the understanding of that last commandment that we love one another. And we're going to break bread together. What's interesting about the Monday Thursday service, if you've never participated, I would invite you to prayerfully consider being a part of our Thursday evening worship service. At the close of that service, we, the body of Christ, remove all the worship elements from the sanctuary. We shroud the altar in a black shroud representing Christ's death for us in the tomb. The tomb was empty and prepared for Christ in darkness. Uh, that moves into Good Friday and, of course, Easter Sunday morning, but it all begins on Thursday evening with our Monday Thursday service. So please prayerfully consider being here on Thursday evening. Something different for Holy Week this year, we will have a uh, Good Friday service, but it will be online only through our Facebook, the platform of Facebook. So if you're watching on Facebook this morning, thank you for joining us. If you participate in our weekly uh, adventures and activities on Facebook, uh, thank you for doing that. And on Friday evening, we'll join together on Facebook for a Good Friday service. And then on Saturday morning, we're going to have the finale of the week for us. We've been waiting for Saturday and Sunday for so long. Our Easter egg hunt was postponed from this past Saturday to this coming Saturday. We have 7,500 eggs that you have packed and prepared with candy. We're anticipating a couple of thousand children to be on the parking lot and the property here. Uh, before we canceled or postponed, we had about 785 families who had recognized through Facebook that they were interested in coming. So thank you for all you who packed eggs and purchased candy. Remember, if you're volunteering for this event, uh, we're going to arrive here at 8 a.m. to prepare all the areas. There'll be face painting and uh, crafts and activities and food. We're going to share food with the young people, a snack for that morning. But the emphasis of that day is the love of God expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. It's our goal and our mission that in us be seen 
the love of Jesus Christ. So if you're interested in participating on Saturday morning for the uh, Easter egg hunt, come out. If you're at home or have other plans, please be in prayer for that day. And then on Sunday morning, we gather the body of Christ at 6.30 on the front lawn of the church for our um, early service, which will be our sunrise service, where we celebrate together the empty tomb, the resurrection of our Lord. And then we're going to join together for just one service at 11 o'clock, combining our 8.30 and our 11 o'clock for one celebration for Easter Sunday morning. So here's your task for the week, church. Be prepared to invite someone to be a part of any of those activities. Invite someone to come and celebrate with you the love of God expressed in the person of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And that should give us excitement. So that's the week before us, and I would invite you as you are able uh, to be the hands and feet of Christ in all those ways. So now with that business behind us, we've come this morning for the purpose of worshiping the Lord, preparing our hearts to be uh, opened to the Holy Spirit this morning. We've been given at least one uh, offering, uh, a created offering of the Lord this morning to express our thankfulness. And I'm going to invite you to stand now as you were able. You were given a bulletin, but we're not using that bulletin as our guide for the music because it all changed between the 8.30 and the 11 o'clock service. Can you imagine that? We chose new music. And so I'm going to invite you to stand and with me as you were able, take with you uh, uh, the, from the pew in front of you the small faith we sing. We're going to sing number 270, He Ex Exalted, two times together. And then we're going to lift our voices and sing, All Hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, King of kings and Lord of lords, bright morning star. Throughout eternity, Lord, it will be our pleasure to praise you, and we do so this morning. We start this morning by praising you. So let's lift our voices together, church. He is exalted, and all hail King Jesus. King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our bright morning star. Church, let's sing together, all hail King Jesus. All hail King Jesus.
that we can stand before you, not righteous in who we are, Lord, not righteous in what we've done, but righteous because you have done for us the great work of salvation in the shedding of the blood of your Son, God. Triumphantly, we stand before you this morning to praise you and to thank you. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, the song of our heart this morning is save us. Save us, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. We lift before you now our praises in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let the church say, Amen. If you're thankful this morning, look at your neighbor left and right and say, I'm thankful, and you may be seated. And you may be seated. Aren't we thankful this morning for who God is? Aren't we thankful to be surrounded by men and women and young people who too are thankful for who God is? I pray my prayer for you as your pastor each day of each week is that you are overwhelmed by the power and the presence of God and the little tiny small things. Anybody seen uh, ornamental cherry blooming in the past week? That is the glory of God. Anybody seen a Helleborus, a Lenten rose in bloom this week? That's the glory of God. Anybody's heard the laughter of a child? That's the glory of God. Anybody heard a song that just stirred and moved your heart? That's the glory of God. Anybody pick up the word of God this week and say, Aha, I've read that, but for the first time it spoke to me in a real way. That's the glory of God. And for that reason, we give God glory this morning and praise. We have the great opportunity as children of God to be in a relationship with God. And we know that that relationship is intimate. It involves words and opportunities for conversation. One thing that's most important about prayer is that we understand that prayer is a two-way street. We acknowledge and offer words before the Lord, but we need to wait before the Lord for the, for the Lord to speak. And so this morning, we're going to have an opportunity to come before the Lord our God and praise, acknowledging all the good things that God is worthy of glory for and of. And we're going to lift before the Lord the concerns of our hearts and lives. And I know you this morning. I, just like you, am human. I'm standing before you leading worship this morning, but I have a tendency to be distracted. Distracted by a lot of stuff happening in the world around us. Distracted by a lot of things happening in my life, my personal life. Distracted by the ministry of church that's happening around us. The demands and expectations of life are all around us. And this morning we're distracted. So God, we come before you and praising you and we invite that you center us, Lord, and that our distractions disappear into the glory of who you are. And so we're going to give God an opportunity this morning to hear those distractions. And we're going to lay those before the Lord so that we can worship God together and hear his word proclaimed. Let there be space in our minds and our hearts today, God, to hear perhaps for us a fresh seed of your word to be planted. And so this morning we're going to do just that. So I'm going to invite you during our praise and prayer time to do two things. We're going to stop in the middle of our praise and we're going to give God praise. And I'd like for you just to acknowledge right where you are the goodness that's God. God, I want to praise you and thank you for this and that and all the good things. And then we're going to pause and we're going to invite the Lord to hear about those distractions this morning. There are a list of individuals that were printed for us that went out on our weekly email. We know that there are individuals among us who are in need of prayer. Today we stand with Dolly Covington's family. Dolly Covington was promoted to glory on Friday evening. She had been battling cancer for a while. We stand with Greg and her family and friends here we give God praise for her promotion to glory where she no longer suffers but stands whole in the presence of God. And God, we lift that before you this morning. It's, it's difficult. So hear that, Lord, as we come to you. And all those individuals on the prayer list who are in need of prayer for healing, cancer treatments, issues with mental health, Lord, we pray that you hear all these before us this morning and we lay those at the foot of the cross. And then we're going to pray together the words of hope that Christ himself taught us as his children. We're going to say together, our Father who art in heaven, the words of the prayer are printed in your bulletin this morning. So I would invite you to join me now in praising the Lord, offering before the Lord the things in our heart this morning that are distractions and hard for us to understand. And Lord, we're going to close that time together announcing the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. And so let's go before the Lord this morning in praise and prayer.
God, we thank you this morning that in the stillness of this space, you are God. We thank you this morning that in the parking lot surrounding the stillness of this space, you are God. We thank you that on the hustle and the bustle and the loud noise of the intersection of Beulah and Hopkins Road, you are God. We thank you that for Chesterfield County and the state of Virginia and for the nation of the U.S. of A. and for our world, God, you are God. We thank you this morning that men and women and young people and children around the globe are gathering on this day to acknowledge that we indeed are in need of a Savior. Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We thank you, Lord. We join that cacophony of voices. The multitudes and millions upon millions of voices this morning, God, praising you to form one voice of praise. We thank you for this incredible opportunity, God. We come before you this morning, God, and we have seen you at work in our life this week. We've seen you in the still, small voice, Lord. We've heard you, Lord, in the voice of a bird that lifted a melody from heaven. We thank you this morning for the daffodils and the insignificant things of life that remind us, God, how creative you are, how purposed you are. We thank you this morning that as we gather in this space, we've come from a week where you have proven yourself faithful. And so we pause now to say thank you. Thank you, God, for answered prayer. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit equipping us, Lord. Thank you for your servants, God, in our lives. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy and grace. God, in your mercy, hear the praises of your people. And God, as we admit that we praise you, we admit and acknowledge that we need you as well. And God, we come before you this morning having already named that there are heavy burdens, Lord. There are distractions that are pulling us away even in this moment because, God, there are loved ones in our heart that need healing. Loved ones in our life, Lord, who need to have an expression of your love and grace as though for them a first time, Lord. Perhaps there are individuals in our lives who don't know you as Lord and Savior. God, our hearts are heavy this morning. We pray for the Covington family, Lord, for your peace and your mercy to be a strong and steady presence. We thank you this morning, God, that around the globe, men and women and children, boys and girls are trusting you, but God, we acknowledge that we need you. God, in your mercy, I pray that you would now hear the prayers of your people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for moving and acting. Thank you for loving and receiving. Thank you for restoring, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you've given us words to celebrate our hope. And so we now, as the body of Christ, lift before you these words of promise and hope, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning as we announce the glory of God forever, we have a great opportunity as the body of Christ to be connected in that way, in a very tangible way. And we say thank you, Lord, this morning for your provision of life as we left before the Lord the gifts of our hearts and lives and tithe and offering. I would invite you to prepare those gifts, church, as we invite the ushers to come.
Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, church, as we lift before the Lord the words of our doxology and thanks. And praise. God, we do praise you and we thank you. And what an incredible opportunity to lift before you the gifts of our hearts and lives, Lord. The provision, your provision, we invite that you bless these gifts, Lord, and use them in our lives, equipping us to serve you faithfully for your kingdom come and your will be done. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray and let the church say amen. And as you are seated this morning, before we hear our scripture text for the day, we take a moment to pause to have a word, a moment of meditation, music provided by our choir. Ain't no rock gonna shout for me. Thank you, choir. I want to invite Barry to come on up to share for us a portion of scripture selected for this day from Psalm 118. And I invite Miss Carol to go out with the children for Children's Church. For those who would like to go out, Miss Carol, thank you for that. So hear now the word of the Lord from Psalm 118, verses 21 through 28. I will give you thanks, for you answered me salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Barry. Unlike most Palm Sunday services, we are not reading from a New Testament text this morning that reminds us about the triumphant entry of Christ in Jerusalem. But I want to remind you that as a church family, we have for the past year and a half devoted our uh, time together throughout the week reading uh, the Bible as a whole. We began uh, with the New Testament a year ago, read the New Testament together on a daily basis. And each day from uh, those texts, as we read those, I kept notes. Uh, and at the end of the week, we'd choose a portion of Scripture read in that week as a family, as a church, to highlight a sermon. And so we've done that thus far this year with the, New, uh, the Old Testament. And thanks be to God, as many of you have said, we've made it through some of the difficult books like Job. And we're now in the Psalm, the book of Psalms, and we have enjoyed that. And so this morning, I'm using a text from uh, our reading in the past week to highlight what we know to be truth in the New Testament. Uh, it was a prophetic word, a prophecy of what it would be, who Christ would be uh, on the triumphant entry uh, in the day, on the day of, in Jerusalem. And so we're, we're, there are two parallel verses that we're holding together um, this morning. And so I rem remind you that we are yet in the book of Psalm and encourage you uh, to be a person of the word, reading the word on a daily basis uh, and looking forward to Sunday mornings when we can break open that word and take a di uh, deep dive together. Um, I can't help but also uh, think about uh, or notice the difference between Christmas and Easter. Uh, it was made really clear to me this week uh, as I uh, searched the radio station for one of my favorite radio stations, which is K-Love. I like to listen to Christian music in the car, and I thought to myself, you know, not even the Christian radio station has a lot to say about Easter, about Passover, or about uh, Holy Week, about Palm Sunday. Uh, there are not many songs that announce and celebrate uh, sort of the culmination of all Scripture. And I begin to think about Christmas, and uh, Christmas music, as we know it, uh, becomes a reality in mid-November, and for some earlier than that. Uh, there's all kinds of Christmas music, and I remember this year, uh, out with my family, uh, while at Chesterfield Town Center, there was Christmas music, blaring through the sound system, Christmas music. On every single radio station, there was Christmas music. I remember being at the dentist, and while the young lady cleaned my teeth, hearing Christmas music, through the system of the dental office there, thinking to myself, Christmas is something that most people celebrate, or at least the music of Christmas. Now, we know that all the music at Christmas aren't Christian Christmas music. There's Frosty the Snowman and Jingle Bell Rock and all the favorite music of our little daughter, Ariella. But there, even in the context of the world, everyone loves Silent Night. The secular radio stations play Christian Christmas music. Yesterday on my phone, Ariella wanted me to pull up the YouTube kids version so she could listen to her favorite Christmas songs. She got her little instruments out and she listened to Jingle Bell Rock and Frosty the Snowman and she was dancing. And I sat in my chair and I thought, you know, where is the song of Easter? Where is the song of Easter? There are no songs on the radio that announce the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You will never hear, Christ the Lord is risen today, anywhere but in church. And it's commonly just one Sunday of the whole year. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah, and then we move on. Even in the Bible, unlike the birth narrative of Christ or what we commonly call the Christmas story, we don't find anyone singing celebratory music. There is no victory song that he's conquered death. There are no heavenly hosts of angels announcing to the world that Christ has risen from the grave. There are no shepherds. There are no wise men. Not even the disciples have a song to sing. The disciples from much of a time post the death of Jesus Christ are silent. 
It's almost as if everyone missed the great point of all of Scripture. So where's the Easter song? I thought to myself, thought to myself this week while sitting in my office, where's the music? Bible scholar N.T. Wright observes a steady crescendo in the gospel's building to the resurrection and the sudden feeling that it happened. The orchestra of the world then fell silent, he says. There is no celebration music. They don't explain. They don't apply any theology. There's no deep meaning to this most important event. The orchestra of the world falls silent. However, in the book of Psalm, as you've read the book of Psalms, you'll know that in Psalm 22, there's a very descriptive understanding of the nails piercing the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. The soldiers gather around as a pack of dogs, says the psalmist. If you read Psalm 24 and Psalm 45, you hear a prophetic description of Jesus entering Jerusalem today. Palm Sunday as we understand it. There in the book of Psalm, a prophetic word that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would be hailed as king and welcomed into the city of Jerusalem. Hosanna, literally meaning save us from ourselves. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet the crescendo falls. And in the very same week, those individuals who cut palms and covered the road in their own coats and jackets stood before Pilate and said, crucify this man. The psalmist understood what was to happen. The psalmist, some many thousands of years, hundreds of years before, understood the importance, the culmination of all of Scripture. And yet... The orchestra creation falls silent. Psalm 118, the scripture text chosen for this day. Psalm 118 is understood in the Jewish tradition as the psalm of salvation. A psalm of salvation. There's always been an incredible strong connection between Psalm 118 and the Passover meal because of a strong connection between God's hand of salvation and the theme of salvation for all of creation. There's a good chance that Jesus and his disciples sang this very song as they entered the city of Jerusalem for what we know to be Palm Sunday. As they traveled to the Mount of Olives, Christ himself very likely sung this psalm, Psalm 118. But this psalm fell silent. Psalm 118, verses 22 through 23, I believe the highlight verse for this portion of Scripture tells us why the created orchestra of the world fell silent. The stone which the builders rejected, the stone which the builders rejected has become our chief cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected. I want to remind you that on Palm Sunday morning, as we know it in Jerusalem, there was a great excitement about the one who would come and be their Savior. We've already acknowledged that in that same week, there was a rejection of the one who would be their Savior, for they misunderstood completely the role of the Messiah. The psalmist prophetically announces that those who welcomed him would be the very ones who denied and rejected Christ the Messiah. The stone which the builders rejected. As I read that portion of scripture again this week, I thought to myself, what is the importance of the understanding of the stone that the builders rejected? Now, we together have studied the word of God. We walked together through the temple weeks ago. We understand the temple, the construction of the temple, the purpose in the temple. The incredible understanding that our God is a God of detail. When in scripture we find the very robes the very uh, clo- clothing that the priest wore in the temple to the detailed beads and the stones found there. God is a God of great detail. And we know the importance of the temple. And as you read the psalm, as the psalm reminds us that even the cornerstone of the temple was rejected. So I did a little historical 
um, investigation as to the building of a temple and the understanding of the phrase, the stone that the builders rejected. There's a very old Jewish tradition that says the rejection of the cornerstone took place while King Solomon was building the temple where the Dome of the Rock now stands today. During the construction, there was no sound of hammers or saws or pounding of any kind so that the temple could be erected in complete silence. The rocks that formed the temple were taken from a quarry underneath the Temple Mount. Still there, there today as you travel to the Temple Mount, you can see the quarry called Solomon's Quarry under the Temple Mount. The temple was built to such an exact blueprint dimension that every rock rock was shaped perfectly in the quarry before it ever left en route to the top, to the temple. When it arrived at the temple, it would perfectly fit in place. According to the tradition, a huge rock was quarried, shaped perfectly, and then sent to the temple mount. When the large rock, rock arrived at the temple mount, the site, the builders could not determine where to place it. It didn't seem to fit. It didn't seem to match. It didn't go according to their blueprints, and so they placed it to one side of the temple, waiting for some advice and direction on what to do with that one rock. Some time passed, and the rock was pushed over the side of the temple mount by some workers there. Tragically, it rolled down into what is known as the Kidron Valley. The builders sent word to the quarry some time later that they were ready for the cornerstone. They were ready for the chief stone, the keystone that would hold the whole temple together. The great rock that held everything in place, they were ready for that great rock. The masons in the quarry sent back the word that the cornerstone had been delivered already. It was sent years before. Someone then remembered. Remember that huge extra rock that we just sort of sat to the side? That big rock that was pushed over the side and rolled down into the Kidron Valley? Maybe that's the missing stone. The workers retrieved the stone, hoisted it in place, only to find that it fit perfectly. It was the keystone. It was the foundation stone for the whole of the temple. The prophetic word in the book of Psalm points to the Palm Sunday as we know it in Jerusalem. Jesus was rejected. Jesus was rejected by religious people of the first century. Jesus was relig the religious people, the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees rejected Jesus because you see, he wasn't who they expected the Messiah to be. I want to encourage you this morning, church, as it was for me sitting in my office this week, an encouraging word that we be so careful, so very careful, that we too in the living of our lives and the anticipation of the one who is our Savior do likewise and re reject the one who is the cornerstone. And you would say, well, Pastor Don, how in the world would we reject the one who is the cornerstone? We're followers of Jesus Christ. On the Sunday they welcomed and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he, who comes in the name of the Lord, but in the living out of their lives in that same week, they stood before Pilate and said, crucify this man, for he is not who we thought he would be. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but no one ever told me there would be dark and difficult days. No one ever told me that I would make mistakes. No one ever said to me that others would hurt me and harm me. No one ever said to me the church can be a difficult place to be. No one ever said of me or to me that there are great expectations that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I'd be perfect. Church, we must be careful that we too don't, do not reject the one who is our Messiah. When Peter preached to the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, he quoted Psalm 118 to show that Jesus, the rejected stone, is the cornerstone of our salvation. The Jewish leaders rejected him, but God accepted him, and not only accepted him, but made him the highest of all positions. Peter pressed the point home with a powerful conclusion. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by men to men which we must be saved. 
These words are utterly exclusive, said Peter. Our faith in Jesus Christ is utterly exclusive. We cannot say we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and yet serve other gods, church. We cannot be an individual who says we follow Jesus Christ simply because we participate in worship. Peter says it's exclusive. He is your Messiah or he is not your Messiah. He is your king, the only name by which you were saved, or he is not your king. He's your one and only and true first love, or he's not your love at all, says Peter. There is no other hope. He is our only hope, church. He is the only way. There is no other name by which we stand before God as those who are counted righteous. I thought to myself this week, I don't want to be like the builder who rejected the stone of salvation in Jesus Christ. I don't want to reject Jesus Christ in the living of my life. And I thought to myself, what are practical ways that I or we as a church could be those, even on Palm Sunday, who reject Jesus Christ as Lord? I want to tell you that all of creation fell silent. Church, the way that you and I are as guilty as those who rejected the stone for the foundation of the temple, just as those who rejected the pharisaical leaders of the church, the temple, the way that you and I are guilty is when we remain silent. Silence is our guilt. That's how we are counted as those who reject Jesus Christ. It's when we remain silent. I want to tell you this morning, the world needs desperately the love and grace of God understood in the person of Jesus Christ. The world needs hope. And when we remain silent in our salvation, we reject the one who is our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. I want to tell you this morning, I don't want to be silent. I don't want to be counted as one who is silent. And in my silence, I reject the one who is the cornerstone, not only of my life, but the life of the world. Those in the world need that foundation. They need the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. So on this Palm Sunday, I refuse to remain silent. I want to announce to the world that there is one name, and that name is Jesus Christ, my Lord. And that profession of that name has changed every part of who I am. How do we reject the one who is our Savior when we, like all of creation, after his death, fall silent? Another way that we reject the one who is our chief cornerstone is in our life choices. First Titus chapter 1, Paul speaks about false teachers denying God by their works. Church, if we're not careful we will live in a way that contradicts what we say we are. If we're not careful, we will live a way that contradicts the very faith that we say we have in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ always, and I want you to hear that, faith in Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, always changes the way you live your life. Always. If your faith in Jesus Christ has had no obvious change and the way you live your life, I would question your understanding of the chief cornerstone. Paul says to the false teachers, be careful that the way you live your life contradicts who you say you are. I do not want my life to contradict the faith that I have in Jesus Christ. For you see, faith in Jesus Christ always changes the way I live. So if your life looks nothing like the person of Jesus Christ, and a whole lot like the world that surrounds you, I would dare say there needs to be a conversation with the chief cornerstone. If your life looks nothing like the one who is your Savior, but a whole lot like the world that surrounds you, guess what, church? Be careful that your lifestyle and your faith isn't contradictory to who you say you are. Our lust for the world and the things of the world is a denial of God's good plan for us. Did you know that? Our lust for the world and the things of the world is a denial of God's good plan for us. Our pride and self and our humanness is a denial of God's place at the center of all things of our life. That's the rejection of the chief cornerstone. All of our disobedience is a denial of God's rightful role 
as our Lord and Savior. Now, Pastor Don, I don't intend to be disobedient. Church, I don't intend to be disobedient either. But every single day, and we've said it here before in this very pulpit, we begin the day, Lord, let our faith be equal to our actions. Let my faith be equal to my actions so there's no contradiction as to who is my Lord and Savior. Lord, let, not, let me not be silent in this day. Let me be a living witness of my faith. And Lord, I'm not comfortable with that. So I need you to give me a holy boldness of your holy scripture to be a living witness, Lord. Let the song of my life be the resurrection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let that be the song I sing. Our words may acknowledge who Jesus Christ is, but our actions may deny who Jesus Christ is. I questioned myself this week with these questions. Don Gibson, are you loving others the way that God loves you? Don Gibson, are you obeying him in every single part of your life? Don Gibson, are you bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? Don Gibson, are you sacrificially giving of yourself your time, your energy, your resources for the kingdom of God. And Don Gibson, are you seeking God every single day in the living of your life? I want to tell you that I noticed recently in the dentist office where my daughter Emma was having her teeth cleaned. It took a little longer because she also had a fluoride treatment. But in the whole time I was there, and I was listening closely, there was not a single song on the radio that mentioned the good news of Jesus Christ. Not one single song. Oh, there was lots of music, but there was not one mention of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now, in that same lobby, Emma made her, made her way back, I noticed a young mother come in with two children. I'm perceptive, not nosy, but perceptive. A few minutes later, a dad came in with two children. And immediately I recognized by their body language that they were one family living in separate houses. Dad had two children. Mom had two children. The children were torn. The children that came in with dad wanted to greet mom and the siblings, but it was awkward. And the two children that sat with mom wanted to greet the dad, but it was awkward. I could sense the awkwardness in the room. So I read my magazine and just sort of watched from the corner of my eye. And as each child was called back, they began to warm to each other. Dad moved over to the area where mom was seating, and they had in common their children. And by this point, it was only the youngest child who was left sitting between the mom and dad. The other three siblings were back having their teeth cleaned. One little girl, about five years old, was sitting between the mom and dad. And what I noted was they both loved her deeply. They loved her deeply. But what I saw and experienced in that day was a fractured, broken, hurting family. Now, the song on the radio didn't address any of that situation. The song on the radio told them to go do what they wanted to do and have a good day. And it wasn't the responsibility of the kind ladies who worked there at the reception desk to notice that brokenness. But it was palpable. I could feel it. I could see their hurt. And I so desperately wanted to say, you need Jesus. Can I help you? And their children filed out, and Mom took two and went her way, and Dad took two and went his way. But I could tell the parents loved each other. But stuff has gotten in the way. Horrible, nasty, hurtful stuff was in the way. At Christmas, we sing of the sweet little baby. You see, we all love that little baby because he's something we can control and hold. We can love baby Jesus. But when Jesus stands before us and demand that he be our king, that's hard to swallow. We don't like the risen Savior Jesus because he demands too much of us. 
We've got to look a certain way and walk a certain way and talk a certain way and think a certain way. We've got to love people and forgive people and bear our cross daily. Oh, no, we don't like that. Give us baby Jesus. We'll sing six weeks in a row straight about baby Jesus. But there's not a song to sing when our Savior stands before us and holds us accountable for who we are, church. My prayer for you, because see, it's my prayer, is that I have a song to sing. Let's not be silent. Let's not be silent. We have a resurrected Lord and Savior who saves us and heals us and restores us in our brokenness and our sorrow. And Lord, let the actions and activities of my life not be contrary to who I say I am. If I say I have faith in Jesus Christ, let me live a life that demonstrates faithfulness, Lord. Am I loving as you love? Am I obeying, Lord, your word? Am I bearing fruit for your kingdom? Am I sacrificially living my life so that someone else's life is impacted for the glory of God's kingdom? Just one person, Lord. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Christmas music. I love Christmas music. But I want to tell you that we have a unique song to sing, church. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a unique song to sing. And the world needs to hear your song. Up from the grave he arose. For me, and for you, and for us. And for your brokenness and your hatred and your ugliness and your obedience, all of it, God. So let my life not be lived in contradiction to who I say I am. So Lord, give me a song today to sing. I want this Holy Week to be a song for you, Lord. Easter Sunday will come and go and we'll move on to the traditions of the church. Oh, but no, we're not. We have a song to sing to the world. Lord. Help me to live a life of faithfulness. Psalm 8, 118. Psalm 118. I will give you thanks, Lord, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of my life. You are my cornerstone, Lord. You have done this, and it is marvelous. The Lord has done it in this very day. Let us therefore rejoice and be glad. I want to tell you this. There aren't many beautiful songs that sorrowful Christians sing. I don't want to be a sorrowful Christian. Let me rejoice this day and be glad. Lord, save us and grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the house of the Lord. We bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. There's our song, church. Now the invitation is ours. I want to tell you what this world needs today. Is some good, joyful Christians who are willing to sing the song of salvation. Not living contrary to what you say you are and what you believe, but living as those who love as Christ loved, who obey the word of God, who bear fruit for the kingdom, who sacrificially give. Lord, let that be me. I have thought this whole week about that family sitting in the dentist office. Every time I think about them, I say a word of prayer for them. But you see, the world is full, this sanctuary this morning, full of hurting people. God, we have a song to sing. Let us be those who sing the song. Give us the song of joy that we sing of our salvation, not only on Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday morning, but each day, Lord, let us not live contrary to who we say we are. God, this morning we come before you and we are thankful. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit, God, that is at work even in this place. God, you are inviting us, Lord, to lay ourselves before you this morning and take stock of who we are.
an inventory of our personal lives, Lord. For if we do indeed say that you are the chief cornerstone of our life, God, how in the world could we ever produce a building that didn't point to you and for your glory? How could our lives not point to you, God, and sing of your glory? But God, we've fallen short of that. We've lost the cornerstone. We pushed it aside. It slipped into the valley, Lord, of our heart and life. And we don't feel equipped to sing such a song. God, often the realities of the world overshadow who you are. We allow our past, our grief, our insecurity, Lord, our brokenness to become what takes center stage in our lives. And God, we invite you this morning to forgive us of that. Free us of that, Lord. Forgive us and free us of that so that we push right into the center of our life for the building of your kingdom, Lord, the chief cornerstone that is Jesus Christ, and let all things be built there and held together for your glory, Lord. Help us not to live contradictory as a church. We are a people who stand firmly on your word, proclaim your word, live your word, Lord. Share the good news of your word. Let you be the center of who we are, God, is our prayer. On this Palm Sunday, God, I pray that you would ignite with us a song of victory. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this great and grand opportunity to sing before you. Lord, I pray that you would, in our lives this week, give give us a song so passionately that we share it with those around us, Lord. We pray that we be faithful, that we be obedient, that we be fruit-producing, Lord, people of your word. God, we praise you this morning for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrificial death. His blood shed for us, Lord, the Passover lamb. We mark the doorpost of our hearts and lives this morning, the doorpost of this church, Lord, with the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ, announcing victory, Lord, over the death angel. We pray this week would be for us a week of understanding your passion, not just your death, but, Lord, your triumphant victory. And let us live a life that sings a song equal to our faith, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you this morning, God. And we left before you the praises of our hearts now as we, your people, say amen. This morning, church, if you believe that to be true, I'm going to invite you to stand just where you are. And we together are going to be called in an affirmation of our faith. We're going to affirm this day that God indeed has given us a song to sing. And we're going to lift that song. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And we respond... And what a beautiful song that was. That's where we start. Now we're going to close our time this morning singing together. Rejoice, the Lord is King, 715 in the red hymnal. The words are also projected for you on the screen. So your singing begins right now as we announce to the world, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
morning, church. That's our song, Rejoicing in the Lord. I pray that you go forth now hearing these words of blessing, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to be faithful. Now to him who is able to keep you all from stumbling, to present you every one faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Go forth, church, with a song to sing. Thank you.